All right, well, so anyhow, I'm really excited to see so many of you here. Um, you know, we, we hold some occasional AES Indianapolis chapter meetings um, every couple of months, and we're lucky if we get about half as many people. So I'm really, really honored and really humbled to have all of you guys here. I had a chance to chat with some of you folks earlier, and, uh, and uh, it's neat to see so many smart, intelligent, awesome people doing such a wide variety of stuff in the industry here. So, so that's really great, and thanks for coming out tonight to, to hear me ramble on a little bit about some, some of this niche side of the industry. So obviously I'm here to talk about STAG, stereo technique for uh, augmented ambience gradient. And so this is a technique that I developed, uh, you know, it's born out of a need. So I do a lot of location recording work. Uh, I've done especially a lot of live concert archiving. Um, that's kind of how I made, made my name in my career. Um, and so the, the, the crux of the problem for me of working on location always had to do with committing to a microphone choice or a microphone placement. I'm always working in, you know, maybe a decent acoustic. I work in a lot of halls of worship, you know, a, a lot of temples and a lot, of, a lot of chapels and things of that sort, which might have really great acoustics, but trying to commit to matching, you know, the exact right microphone choice from a directional standpoint, from a total timbre standpoint, to the period of music and the size of the ensemble inside of that acoustic, right? The, the acoustics of the space is just as much an important sort of instrument to the ensemble as the instrument itself. Um, and I'm always teaching my, my students or anyone I'm mentoring in the field about trying to match those things up. But of course, working on location, I never have sort of a traditional control room to work with, so I'm monitoring on headphones. And it can be difficult to make judgments on headphones when you don't have loudspeakers to be able to compare that to. So I wanted to develop a technique that allowed me some flexibility later on in the mix so that I wasn't quite married to those decisions. Um, so that's sort of the backstory um, behind how this technique came about. So there are a couple of different standard mic techniques we use when working on location or recording chamber music in general. And usually you kind of have to make a decision between these two paradigms. On one end, you have sort of detailed stereo imaging. You can mic make out kind of where each and every instrument comes from. And so you might use one particular mic, mic technique to do that. Or you can take the standpoint of having a really nice, rich sort of spatial envelopment, but maybe not very good discrete localization of any particular instrument source. Um, I love both of these things for very different reasons, but I don't want to have to make that choice uh, necessarily, and I don't want to be married to either of one of those when I'm in what I think of as sort of a compromised monitoring environment. Um, so I wanted to come up with a technique that allowed me, you know, some options and some flexibility. Um, one of the things I did in my background, sort of in all of these travels and doing all these grad degrees and working various jobs, I used to work in uh, the Binaural Hearing and Speech Lab at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, and I did a lot of, lot of research, direct stem stuff on mostly kids with bilateral, bilateral cochlear implants. And working in that field got me really excited about human auditory perception, how we localize sounds. Um, and one of the things that, that we sort of grapple with as audio engineers is how to present an ensemble in a way that's sort of appropriate to the media. So CD, whatever, playback, online, um, where it's strictly auditory. If you go to a live performance, you sit in the audience, you can see exactly where each one of those musical sound sources is. That visual element gives a very strong localization cue. And it also helps you parse out that signal and noise kind of scenario where you're like, oh, I see you know, the flautist is playing something. I can now hone in on that. I know where it's coming from. I have an expectation based upon the timbre of that instrument to be able to figure that out. Great, I know where that is playback over headphones or loudspeakers where you don't have those visual cues, you can't always necessarily replicate that or replicate that very reliably. Uh, maybe we go with a mic technique that allows us the rich spatial envelopment because that gives you that sense of envelopment and being surrounded like you would be if you were sitting in a, you know, totally, uh, you know, vertically and horizontally surrounded environment. Um, but then it doesn't have these localization cues. But since we're playing back for a medium that does not have that visual element, it might be nice to give those spatial cues in an even more particular way um, than if you were sitting in the audience to fill in that visual gap that you don't get with just an auditory playback medium. So this is sort of the struggle. 
So, working on location and the conundrum of headphone listening. So, headphones, do they pose a problem? Well, yes. So, they, first of all, they provide too much timbral detail when compared with loudspeakers. You have essentially two loudspeakers mounted to your head. They're right there. You get all this great high frequency detail that you would get a little bit of a roll off because of losses in air and things like that with speakers. So lots of timbral detail. It also presents a wider stereo image because we don't have any crosstalk, right? You sit in front of loudspeakers, both ears are getting the left speaker. You put on headphones, left ear gets left speaker only. So that presents things in a wider stereo image. So that's the downside. There's an upside too. Do headphones pose a solution? Well, a vast majority of music listeners are listening this way, right? All the kids these days, and most of us probably at this point as well, are running around with smartphones, uh, well, that used to have headphone jacks on them. Um, so, but we're listening on headphones, and because we like the uh, portability of mobile, we like how it's lightweight, it's easy to access, all of those things. So maybe headphones also pose a solution. I'm monitoring on location with headphones. That's how maybe 80% of my listeners are going to uh, receive this music anyways. So maybe I can take advantage of that. Um, but it'd be nice if I could present you know, a, a convincing and a quality product on both platforms. So I got to honor the loudspeaker listeners as well. So, which do I choose or favor? Well, if I take the direction of good stereo imaging, there's sort of two main stereo mic techniques that come to mind. So Blumline is, is a long time favorite of the industry in terms of its really accurate stereo imaging. It's two uh, bi-directional microphones positioned uh, coincident to one another, so they're right on top of one another, 90 degrees off axis. And so that combined response gives us, if we ignore any time uh, aspects to the sound, because the mics are coincident, everything arrives at both microphones at the same time. So we take a look at that combined sound. Yeah, it gives us a pretty easy, uh, even look uh, all the way around uh, the microphones. So great. So we get just as much information from the back as we do from the front, as we do from the sides. And because of those, uh, those discrete patterns pointing left and right, it gives us a really good you know, way to localize from an ILD, interaural level uh, standpoint, as to where those sounds are coming from. Um, also, uh, so sound energy from all directions, discrete and accurate locations of sound sources. Strong impression of reverb because of the rear lobes on the microphone. So that's nice too. Uh, that gives us some, some sense of ambience in the space, but there's a trade-off. So coincident placement of the mics presents a flat or one-dimensional impression of the sound stage. So you know what we had is this nice discreetly laid out ensemble sort of gets squished visually, right? So the the depth of field we hear in the recording ends up going like this. So the piano sounds a little closer, the soloist sounds a little further away. We don't have that nice rich two-dimensional or pseudo three-dimensional picture anymore. It flattens things out. Okay, so that's one choice. Another choice is ORTF over on the right. Uh, French broadcast company came up with this technique, which is another favorite of the industry because it mimics the way we hear. So you have two directional microphones. It favors sound coming from the front. That can be good in an acoustic where it's maybe a little too live and you need to focus in a bit more on the ensemble. But it makes use of not only the interaural level differences because of the directionality pattern, but because they're spaced apart, we get ITD cues as well. And the 17 centimeters that they use is about an average width between the ears of the human head. Great. So we get some interaural time cues as well. That gives us some of that three-dimensionality three back. It doesn't sort of flatten the presentation. It does give us uh, really nice and fairly discrete uh, localization points of all the instruments. Um, and, but it favors the front side, right? Because if we look at this combined all together, we're not really getting much of anything from the back side. So, that's a bit of a conundrum, especially if we're recording music that requires a lot more ambience in it, say it's a classical or a romantic period piece, or even an impressionistic period piece, and we need to make use of as many of those reflections and all that reflected energy from inside of the acoustic space. This only gives us maybe about half or two-thirds of the picture. So, uh, so again, Primarily direct sound, discrete and reasonably accurate sources, reduced capture of reverb, which might be an advantage depending on the period and the acoustics. And then semi-coincident angular spacing presents realistic or more two-dimensional impression of the sound stage. Great, so we get some depth of field back. Awesome. 
Then there's AB Omni, and this is sort of at the other end of the, uh, of the spectrum. So we don't get directional discretion from the microphones anymore. We can do that with microphone placement, but we get direct sound and we get a lot of the spatial envelopment from the space. However, since we're not being very discretionary in terms of where sound's coming from from the front, the only thing we get is a bit of ITDQ, and there's basically no level difference between the mics. This gives a really nice, rich, enveloping kind of sound, but it gives us very little in terms of an auditory cue to be able to hang on to. Because if you get a sound source that's off to one side or the other, a little bit or a lot, because of those time of arrival differences, all of a sudden you get all kinds of filtering going on, especially over um, loudspeaker listening. And you can actually, if you listen really carefully, you could take, say, a clarinet that's 45 degrees off to the side of the ensemble. You close your eyes, you listen. It's like, well, I hear the high register of the instrument coming from here. I hear the middle end of the register coming from here. It's coming from like six different places. So it's, it's not really great from a, uh, a localization standpoint. Um, and combined response, you know, it's just a big omnidirectional thing. So great for envelopment, but not so great for being able to create those discrete points, right? And so there's sort of the summary, and then we're back to our impressionistic picture. Hard to tell exactly where things are, right? OK, so the answer to uh, our problem, going back to the ORTF scenario, we do have good localization points. Um, how do we add some reverb, right? Because if it's too dry, we get the localization, but we need more reverb. So we do one of two things. Either we add more mics, not necessarily like this, but I thought it was sort of a funny picture. There's like 18 <coughs> microphones on that piano. Typically what we do when we're working on locations, we'll take a pair of Omni microphones and we'll put them eh, half two thirds of the way back in the hall, one on the left, one on the right, really widely spaced. We get lots of decorrelated reverberant energy back there. And we just throw that in as another pair of channels in the mix. And it's like a reverb return, but it's not artificial. It's realistic to the space where we were recording. Well, to go back to the headphone listening, you know, I'm trying to present to the listener the most ideal seat in the house, if I can. And I very carefully choose my mic position with my main pair of mics to be representative of that most sort of awesome ideal placement. Well, the decorrelated energy that I'm bringing in from the back of the hall isn't true or honest to that best seat in the house position that I've very carefully picked out. Um, and it also doesn't do a great job of creating that, that sense of envelopment. It, it, it works, um, and a lot of engineers do it, and that's why, but, but it's maybe not the most optimized thing. Then, of course, the other option is add in a bunch of artificial reverb, which isn't necessarily true or accurate to the space at all. It's just artificial reverb. So um, you can sort of make your argument for or against that, depending on how you feel on it. All right, so I wanted control. I wanted localization, so reasonably accurate representation of any single location, because we don't have the visual element, so give that to the listener. I want spatial stability, so of the dry sor source locations, when altering that reverberant energy. So I want to be able to turn that reverb up and down and have everything stay put. Don't move it around. Mixed flexibility, so independent control over the ratio of source and reflected sound, direct to ambient. And I want a timbral control over the source separately from the ambience, because maybe I need to rebalance it a little moment here or there to help emphasize a, a solo or whatever. I've got you know a 200 hertz problem because of the width of the room or something like that. So I want to be able to EQ those things a little bit without affecting one from the other. So I thought about how could I do this, and I experimented with a couple of different mic techniques. And this is initially what I came up with, the idea of, OK, so I know ORTF is pretty representative if you're sort of facing forward of an ensemble. It doesn't give us the reverberant energy, but it does a pretty good job if I'm in a fairly dead space of, you know, I can close my eyes, and it's like, oh, OK, yep, there everybody is coming from the appropriate location. So I started experimenting with this, and I said, great, let me put another ORTF pair coincident to that that faces to the back of the room. That way I can have dry sound on the front, reverberant energy from the back. Hopefully I'll be able to turn that up as a pair of reverb returns. Great, right? Well, it actually worked reasonably well, but the problem was is using cardioid microphones for the front and cardioid microphones for the back have so much overlap with one another, especially at that 110 degree angle, that when I turned up my reverb returns, even if it was just something as narrow as a string quartet, 
the first violinist and the cellist, as I wrote up the reverb, would go from sitting here to moving over here. That's a problem. So I needed to find a, uh, find a way to, to resolve that issue. Um, so I started playing around with some other, uh, some other directionality patterns. Um, so uh, I also, because of my auditory perception and, and, and um, uh, binaural perception uh, research background, I wanted to also make sure that what I thought was functioning wasn't a personal bias because I came up with this new awesome stereo mic technique. And I should say, this is not an end-all be-all stereo mic technique. None of these are the end-all be-all. It can work great in certain locations and certain scenarios like any other stereo mic technique. This is just another choice out there um, as, as an option to use. But it does work for a lot of applications. So, sorry, but I digress. So the idea is I want to make sure that other listeners agree on where these sounds are coming from. It's not just me because I was there and I can picture the ensemble in my head and I have that visual bias. So, um, also, do they feel enveloped and sort of equivalently so by the sound? So, I wanted to make sure that, you know, one person's perception of, of how much they're, they're perceiving that sense of envelopment somewhat matches what another person hears because, you know, all of our ears are a little bit different and, and our brains and how we perceive that sound is a little bit different. Also, is this an effective technique for improving the listener experience over headphones? Again, 80% of my listeners are listening on headphones. I want to make sure that I'm using something that translates well for them. So I decided to do some research and conduct a study. So, but in order to do that, consistency of the presentation is really important. I wanted to try all these different combinations of microphones and angles. But how the heck do I get a string quartet to sit there and it ended up, even after refining it down as much as I could in terms of combinations of microphones and angles, it still worked out it was going to be, I needed an ensemble to play this the exact same way 31 times in a row. And I, I, I took a piece of music and, and sort of edited it down to be as, as short and concise of what I needed out of that piece of music as possible. Um, uh, but even so, no, you know, no self-respecting string quartet was going to show up to a session and play the exact same, you know, 30-second snippet for me 30 times in a row. And even if they would, they're not going to play it the exact same way every single time. So, all right. So, how the heck do I do I do this? Uh, and 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 so that they still like me. So, what I chose to do was record each one of the instruments in isolation with a couple of different microphone options. So in this particular example, you know, I've got a KSM-131, which is a, a nice sounding ribbon mic, works great on cello in the front, and a Sheps, I think that was an MK4 uh, or an MK-41. And then I've also, a little harder to see, I've got another MK-4 sort of under the chair to catch the back side of the instrument. So. A string quartet was my sound source. These instruments produce very different frequency responses and lots of different angles from the instrument. If I were to just record this and present it into a space as a single loudspeaker, well, loudspeakers are really directional. It throws, you know, especially at high frequencies, throws stuff towards the front. I need to excite the hall, at least in some way. It's going to be somewhat similar to what the instrument might do in that space. So I recorded you know, from a couple of different spots on the instrument. And then I presented it into the space using a series of loudspeakers and then corrected the frequency response for the playback of the loudspeakers so that they were accurate to what the instrument sounded like. And it would sort of excite the room. Now, so I'm doing my best here to try and condense what was about three years worth of just the research part of work down into, you know, sort of a half hour presentation of this. But there were actually two separate uh, recording sessions that I did in two separate spaces uh, that were about a year and a half apart. There were two individual studies that I did in order to examine this um, in different combinations of mics and techniques. This was the second one that I happened to do at a, at a hall uh, at McGill University had some assistants who helped me out there. But it's a nice space. You can see over in the picture on the left. Um, so there's sort of a, a stage area. Then there's an old French style tracker organ up in the balcony above. It's a fairly wide room, but much, much longer than it is wide. So it's sort of traditional concert hall dimensions. Uh, it's a really nice sounding acoustic space. Uh, and so I was able to make these recordings. Obviously, it's going to be the same exact sample that I'm playing back every time, so that's nice. Everything's consistent. Laid them out on stage in about you know, a similar spacing to what a string quartet might do for recording sessions. And then all I had to do was record a playback, change the microphone, switch the angles, record another playback, things of that sort. Um, 
I did a bunch of these samples. I'm not going to play them all back for you, but just so you get an idea of, of what these sound like, uh, I can play you three of each. And so let me just, next slide. Oh, sorry. Um, I'll get to the playback in a second. Um, so there are a couple of different things I wanted to take a look at. So I needed a listener response graph so they could tell me what they perceived as the localization points for each one of these instruments both in a dry scenario, so only the ORTF, the front-facing ORTF pair, although I wasn't just using traditional ORTF, not just 110 degrees. I also wanted to look at narrower angles as well, because um, I felt like uh, with ORTF, sometimes you get a little bit of this hole in the middle of, uh, of the mix kind of effect, and often your most important instrumentalist happens to be at the center of the ensemble. Um, so I wanted to take a look at that problem a little bit. Um, so LOC stands for localization. So loke dry, then also loke wet. So their localization perception when I incorporated those rear-facing microphones, did the ensemble spread out and get wider when I incorporated that? So I wanted to look at that as well. Um, and also wanted to give uh, a variety of cues. So not just musical cues, but there were also some speech and clicks for all of those locations as well. Um, so that's the first part of it. And then, uh, actually, so I can play those back for you now. Did, ev did everybody who could end up with uh, some headphone options? I know there are some wireless sets going around. Dean, could we get those out if they're not already? No one ended up with anything yet. Oh, OK. So here's how playback is going to work. I'm going to have it in loudspeakers. Uh, simultaneously with that, we've also got uh, a bunch of wireless uh, sets here for headphones, so you can also listen to the playback exactly how they would have done uh, in the listener tests. So anyone who wants a pair of headphones... Okay, let's do it this way. There's eight. I can take them around and I can drop and share amongst yourself. So we get eight on here to start. Bob's going to start thing off. So while Dean's handing those out, let me just go over the different samples. So uh, there were about eight that I ended up presenting to the listeners, and I'm going to play you three of each of these. Uh, so in sample B, the 20 represents, it's a 20 degree angle uh, for each of the microphones at the front. So 20 degrees left, 20 degrees right. So it's a 40 degree space for an ORTF pair, which is way narrower than what you know most any engineer would use for an ORTF. TF pair. The microphone choices were Sheps MK4s, which are cardioids, so that's a really traditional microphone choice um, for recording ORTF of chamber music. So that's for, for sample B. For sample D, 40 degrees per mic, so that's an 80 degree angle. Um, and then sample G, 60 per mic, so it's a 120 degree angle. And so that's going to give you an idea of the localization points of the musical sources, as well as uh, the clicks, which will follow. And I just broke them down into seven positions across the stage. Yes? Do you, do you have these files on the website someplace? Uh, I do not. No, I'm sorry. But if you email me, I'd be happy to share them with you. And I can send you all of them that way as well. So just come up and see me after, and, and I'd be happy to Dropbox them to anybody who wants to listen to these. Dean? So if you're not familiar and you've got one of these power and volume, right, or together, right is red. Cool. The one with the wires, the left channel. So, all right. So, I'm going to play you the very first example here, and I'm going to do a quick sound check just to make sure that everybody who's on headphones can adjust their volume to a comfortable listening level. It's not going to get dramatically louder or quieter in volume. So, what you hear at the beginning is how it's going to be sort of throughout. So. <laughs> So is everybody good for level? OK, how about everyone who's just listening to loudspeakers in the space? We're good? Great, OK. So here's the first example.
skip the clicks because I think you kind of get the point. So, um, but tried to, to edit the piece of music or arrange the piece of, piece of music down so you got a little bit of homogeneity of the whole ensemble. You get a little bit of, of soloisticness of each individual instrument. And also at the end with the pizzicatos, you can also make some judgments about sort of the length of reverb and how much reverb you're perceiving. So all the things that we needed the listener to, to respond to. Um, so that's the first sample. Everybody heard that as a stereo ensemble, I would assume, right? I mean, there's some width, there's some presentation there, yet much narrower pair of microphones or angles on the microphones than what we would traditionally do with ORTF. So I think just from that example alone, it makes the argument, OK, so we don't have to follow the rules of ORTF as strictly as they're presented in the textbooks. We can get away with some narrower angles. So all right, um, so let me jump ahead to the next audio example. Hang on one second. So hopefully everybody perceived that as an increased width in the ensemble. So we're still a little narrower from what ORTF would be traditionally. Um, so, but it it's gives you sort of a hyper real sense of the space of the ensemble by doing that. So taking advantage of the medium, compensating for the lack of visual element a little bit. Um, and then finally, the widest one. All right, so there's the widest perspective. So probably sounds a bit more natural on loudspeakers than headphones. Probably sounds a bit hyper wide. I may have missed something. Were we listening to the dry B? D, yes, these were the, the, the first three things listed here. So B, D, and G. You were just listening to G on the low dry. And the 20, 40, 60 relate to what? The angles between the microphones. 20 degrees, 40 degrees, 60 degrees. Yep. Absolutely. OK. So, um, so that gives you a variety of the, the width of the presentation of the ensemble. Now let me play you some examples that make use of the rear-facing microphones as well. The first round of studies when I did this, it was just playing around with angles of a front-facing ORTF and a rear-facing ORTF in the sense that they were cardioids in all the instances. That's where I really discovered the consistency of this problem of riding up the reverb and the ensemble getting much wider. So in the second study, which is the recording session that the, with, from the pictures that you saw, um, I played around with more directional rear options. So, and in this case, I'm keeping the 20 degree angle at the front the same because I think that's mm, a little hyper wide in terms of present, uh, presentation over headphones, but it's, it ends up being fairly natural over loudspeakers. So now let's just compare some differences between the rear options. So again, MK4 is across the front, but in the rear we've got uh, a Shep CMIT5U, which is this bright blue shotgun microphone, low, low 
lobar microphone. So very directional towards the sides. The idea behind that was, well, if I can use a really directional microphone, there's sort of two benefits that I'm trying to take advantage of. The first is, if it's that narrow, hopefully I can ride the reverb up to at least match gain, if not even more, if I needed a little extra ambience in the space without having the ensemble pull to the sides. Um, and the second issue is, if you study listener perception in concert hall acoustics, there's actually a, a bunch of great papers on the subject. David Graysinger kicked off a lot of this stuff. But um, if you look at listener perception, the most important uh, cue for listener sense of listener envelopment are horizontal or lateral reflected energy in the space. Not the stuff that bounces off the floor or the ceiling or the back wall, but the stuff that goes side to side between the walls, sort of horizontally in the space. So by using a really wide angle and using shotgun microphones, I can kind of focus in on just that lateral reflected energy. Um, so here we'll listen to the shotgun, we'll listen to the cardioid, and then we'll also listen to a Sennheiser 8050. There's a reason I chose that microphone to, to play for you, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little later on. Um, but let me, let me play you these examples first. So again, we're starting with the first one there. So this is going to be 20 degrees in the front and 100 degrees with the shotgun in the back. even sounds like a real quartet. You get that little chair squeak at the end. <laughs> Anyhow, so uh, did everybody perceive a difference? Yeah? yeah? OK. So the idea is hopefully you get that sense of sort of wide sense of development in the space. And 
for me at least, when I'm listening to it, you know, especially the shotgun one, if I close my eyes listening on headphones, I almost feel like I can hear the reverb coming kind of from the back of my head even a little bit. So with the cardioid, it starts to pull the edges of the ensemble a little bit wider. Uh, and then the Sennheiser 8050, yeah, it probably sits somewhere in between, that kind of a thing. So that's the first part of the test, looking at the localization aspect. Um, then I also, of course, wanted to uh, take a look at listener envelopment and how much they felt like it was effective. So the idea is you have to give people sort of a benchmark and a scale and some way to relate these things. So the idea, first of all, is I needed to define it because, you know, a lot of my listeners, even though they all had some sort of musical background, whether they were audio engineers or performers or, or whatever, everybody had, had some sort of musical training, but not everybody understands quite what listener envelopment is. So as part of the test was we had to define it for them. So, Listener envelopment is the listener's perception of being surrounded or enveloped by sound, which is primarily produced by late arriving reflected energy. So, and we talked to them a little bit about the direct sound versus, you know, the reflected energy of the space. So, um, and again, this was done with, with music and clicks. Um, I'll play you the music, musical examples for the sake of brevity today. But we gave them uh, a response graph. And so what you'll hear is three things. So the very first one is monaural. So it's the most compact. It's not going to have much sense of envelopment at all. In fact, on headphones, it should sound like it's kind of coming from the middle inside of your head. Um, then what I thought was going to be the widest thing is a pair of spaced omnidirectional microphones in the space, because it's very decorrelated energy. There's essentially no monaural component to that. So that would sound very, very wide. That's a 10 on the scale. The mono is the 0 on the scale. And then I would play them the stag combination and say, you tell me, where does this end up on the scale? Um, and so it was kind of neat because, you know, most responses for narrower angles or for the, the uh, supercardioid microphones, eh, they ended up somewhere in the like four, five, six, seven range, something like that. Um, but then when it come, came to listening to the shotgun examples, uh, they either wrote down 10 or they would kind of go off the scale and they would put like an 11 or a 12 on there because they said, oh, this actually sounds wider and more enveloping to me than the Space Dominies, which is, you know, uh, a, that's really kind of a neat finding. Um, and so that was sort of an exciting aspect of it. Uh, so let me play you those. And this is just a very short snippet because mostly we were taking a look at their sense of development. So I made use of a bit at the beginning and a bit at the end of the piece so we could really focus in on hearing that reverb tale. <laughs> Oh, shoot. I'm sorry. Hang on. I'm jumping ahead. All right. I'll let you hear all three. So you're going to hear the zero example, the 10 example, immediately followed by uh, the technique that's described up there. So again, this is the first one. Yeah. 
So those are the three samples. Um, and if you want to take a look after we're done, you can take a look at the responses for each one of those samples, including all the ones that we didn't hear. Um, and they're all down here on the poster. But the shotguns win. The shotguns have it. They consistently gave the widest perception because they're focusing in on those lateral reflections. So yay, the hypothesis worked out, focusing on those and presenting those things. So. Um, and the other thing is we can feel comfortable using narrower angles than the traditional ORTF technique. And it helps fill in the middle of the ensemble a little bit and gives us a little more realistic presentation. So that kind of takes us through uh, how I arrived at the technique. Of course, in the process of doing all of these samples and trying to reposition all the mics using traditional stereo mic bars, was an absolute nightmare. So sort of the next stage of, which wasn't on the research side, but the development side, is I ended up designing uh, a stereo mic positioner that allows me to do this more quickly and easily when I'm at the gig. Because it took so much time, that's fine for a research study. But you know, if I've got a half hour to set up before a concert event, I can't be sitting around struggling with stereo mic positioners trying to get things into the right position. So I worked with a guy who works for Welch Allen designing uh, medical equipment hardware and uh, kind of gave him a, a design, and, and he did some machining work for me. So now the idea is uh, I have this plate, and I've made use of some, some grace, some of uh, the grace designs modular mount pieces. And so if I need to change angles, I can just loosen things and change the angles of the mics. Keeps everything nicely coincident. But if I'm, you know, I'd go and listen, and, oh, that's a little too wide, oh, that's a little too narrow. I can make those adjustments really easily. Um, takes me no time at all. So that's, that's helped make my, uh, my life a lot easier on the application side. So in terms of, uh, let me make sure I'm not getting ahead of myself here. So in terms of where this is getting used out in the industry, there are a couple of different places. I've got a number of audio examples, which I want to play for you folks. Um, and again, I'll make use of loudspeakers. Uh, so you'll hear it in stereo. I can also present things in surround, as well as over headphones. And we can play around with the mix a little bit to compare those things. But some places you can hear this. So some of the samples I'm going to play for you came from one of my colleagues, uh, Alex Kosorek at KBOC Radio in Phoenix. Uh, he manages a really fantastic fantastic uh, radio station out in Phoenix, Arizona that focuses primarily on classical music. They also do all the, uh, all the, the live recording and broadcast for the Phoenix Symphony. Um, so he's, he tried this technique out a little bit when we were both engineering at the Aspen Music Festival. Uh, and he really kind of took to it. And he's been using this for their, uh, their radio broadcasts. Also in their, their HD digital radio streams, they also encode it for DTS Neural. This works incredibly well for surround playback. So if you have the ability to decode it at home uh, from HD radio, you can listen to that uh, in surround sound. It also will decode through Dolby Pro Logic 2. It doesn't work quite as well, um, but, it, but it still functions pretty well as surround. So it's not only an effective stereo mic technique, it's also a really effective surround microphone technique. And certainly takes up a lot less space and is a lot less uh, sort of physically cumbersome than some other uh, surround microphone techniques that are out there. Uh, 
There are some that work really, really great. You know, a lot of people really like Fukata tree or Hamasaki tree, things of that sort. But that's the kind of thing that can be really difficult to hang or put it, you know, it, it might be a little nervous making to put that on a microphone stand down the center aisle of a live concert event. This is pretty discreet. You can hang it easily in a hall. You can put it up on a single mic stand and it's not too unwieldy and it doesn't sort of take over the room. So it's sort of nice from a discretionary standpoint as well. Um, I've all also used this uh, in a number of my own recordings, some of which uh, John was referring to earlier. So uh, this, I do a lot of, uh, sort of one of my main areas of specialty uh, in classical music recording is working with chamber choirs. Uh, so I've been working for the last 10 years with this group called Seraphic Fire based in Miami. Um, and gotten a couple of Grammy nominations for stuff that I've recorded for them, as well as some favorable write-ups in Gramophone Magazine. I use SAG on these uh, on these recordings. They're they're in, done in a really good acoustic space. So this is not just something that you know I sort of thought up with and you know I'm I'm trying to to tout as you know a, a great concept in theory. It came out of practice first, and this is something that I that I use uh, regularly on on professional recording work. So there's a couple of places you can you can see that uh, and listen to it out there regularly. So. Um, Finally, so I'm going to sort of wrap things up visually at this point, uh, and of course wanted to do honor to my sponsors here. So obviously had support from McGill and the Center for, for Interdipl Interdisciplinary Research in Music, Media, and Technology, which is a center at McGill. They're the ones who provided me with all the speakers and with the really collection, uh, expensive collection of microphones to be able to choose from to try all of these combinations of mics and angles, things of that sort. Um, Hot Springs Music Festival. Uh, for seven years straight in the summer, I went and worked for this two-week-long um, music festival. Uh, they're the only music festival in the country that is free to all of their musician apprentices. So it's, it's sort of like a mini version of those of you who are familiar with the Aspen Music Festival. Top musician performers come from all across the country there to be mentored by and play side by side with professional musicians from professional orchestras all across the country, all across the world. Um, it costs them $6,000 a summer to go do that program. Hot Springs Music Festival, it's only two weeks long, but it's the only one where all you have to pay for is to get there. Everything else is provided you once you do get there. So it's a really neat program. For seven years, I ran their audio mentorship program as a part of that. So I'd have you know three or four or five audio apprentices who worked underneath me. But they give concerts all over the city of Hot Springs, Arkansas during those two weeks. So every day, we're in you know sometimes as many as three different spaces, setting up a pair of mics, doing a sound check during rehearsal, recording a concert. And we're always on headphones, because none of these spaces have a traditional control room. So you know, it was a, 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 a very immediate way for me to feel the need to come up with a solution to handle this problem, and to be able to try it and test it in a bunch of different spaces, back to back to back, even just over the course of a single day. So in a way, they were sort of the main inspiration for me to come up with this technique. So I have to thank them for that. Of course, KBOC Radio for sending the audio samples, which we'll listen to in a little bit. UMass Lowell, where I started my master's, that's where I did the first phase of this study. So they provided me with a bunch of loudspeakers and microphones to be able to try. And then, of course, Sure for hosting us and uh, the Audio Engineering Society, because they've done a lot for me over the years. So anyhow, thanks to those sponsors. So, but can we cut video at this moment, and then, then we'll go to audio playback? Just let it run out. And then you just... Cut it later? OK, great. So um, let's do this. So I've got a couple of different things. Um, I'm going to hold off on that one for a moment. Let me pull up another audio project I here. I have one question for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and please, feel free to ask questions. I, I'm looking at your setup here, but could you describe it, please? I'm yeah. Not sure what is facing what and all Sure, that. absolutely. Yeah, so the idea is the front of the ensemble would be here, right? So these are your musicians you're trying to record. So with the silver microphones, this is a pair of, of um, Shure KSM32 cardioid pencil condensers. And they essentially make up the main ORTF pair. They would usually be a bit wider if they're set as ORTF. 110 degrees is the standard. I usually end up in, you know, in my professional recordings these days, I end up somewhere between the 70, 80, 90 degree angle range, something like that ends up working out pretty well. And then the rearward facing microphones, uh, I use uh, 
a pair of short shotguns. Depending on the acoustics of the space, I might use long shotguns as well, but uh, the shotgun pair of microphones are typically a very wide angle, 100 to 120 degrees, something like that. And so they're pointing uh, sort of laterally out towards the back of the room, but again, mostly focusing on the lateral refre reflected energy in the space. So, and then just you know put it on a swivel mount so I can change angle and things like that fairly easily. But that's the idea behind the technique. So, uh, yes, sir. Or, pardon me, yes, 137s. Exactly. Yeah, no, 32s are much bigger. <laughs> yes? I wonder if you could comment on an earlier part of your presentation. Sure. When you talked about uh, the problem of having those live musicians repeat so you recorded them and made a loudspeaker ensemble. Mm hmm. Uh, so not directly. Because the quartet wasn't recorded as a traditional quartet, they were recorded individually in an ISO booth to begin with, there was no way to make that direct comparison. That said, you know, I've come, sat down and compared this to other just string tour quartet recordings that exist or quartet recordings that I've done, just as an overall sort of sound comparison. So. Got it. Um, so just total amount of reverb is a huge part. It doesn't necessarily influence how I position the mics, but that'll uh, decide how I end up using things in the mix later on. So again, is it is it Baroque? Is it medieval? Is it is it classical, romantic, impressionistic? OK, so that's a whole spectrum of amount of reverb. Um, you know, if it's medieval, it's going to be very, very dry. If it's Baroque, it's going to be be fairly intimate, but have some reverb in it. And then we start to get into more and more reverb as you go, you know, romantic, classical. If you think about the concert halls and the places these, these styles of music are traditionally performed, we're starting to get into like larger, grand, more grandiose halls. And there's a larger sense of reverb. Early reflections tend to come later, things of that sort, um, until you get to impressionistic, which can you know, depending on the piece, can be sort of in a smear of reverb. Things are also written stylistically differently. You know, there's a lot more legato phrasing in, in the impressionistic music than there might be in something classical. Um, so I, I don't have a, a like a quick tip answer for you, but the idea is I try to find the appropriate marriage between all of those things. So the period of music and the size of the ensemble then factor in the size of the space and how much reverberant energy, or if it's even a reverberant energy that I like the sound of. I don't always use this. Again, it's not a, you know, a, a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, I might set up the stag, but decide that the, the rear-facing microphones just don't work in that room because it's not a very flattering reverb in the space. It's just not a good acoustic space. And then I'll, I'll probably go to the artificial reverb uh, to make that work um, because that ends up muddying things up if it has you know a lot of 300 to 600 hertz buildup in the space or something like that. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a, a quick like, this is what you do answer, but... Right. There. Yeah. I mean, there's there's something about you know that that spaced A B Omni technique that I I love the enriching sound of, but you're married to it. You can't change the amount of reverb you've got in that later on in the mix. So I ended up starting to position those microphones closer and closer to the ensemble. That way, I had the ability to maybe add a little bit of reverb later on. But even then, you know, your your hands are tied because the tail might be quieter, but the length of the tail of reverb is still there no matter what. So ORTF and a more directional pair in the front really ended up working better for me and leaving me that that room for flexibility in the back, way in the back. Yes. It is. Yep. I mean, it's it's stereo playback, but in the HD radio examples, it's it's encoded for DTS and and Dolby Pro Logic too, so that they can decode the rear channels from that. 
So, yep. But you're going to yeah, I record four discrete channels. Yeah, each one of those microphones goes to a discrete track in my DAW. There's no mixing on the way in. That way, I have that flexibility later on. And uh, I use Sequoia for this stuff, um, and it's for those of you who aren't familiar, it's it's similar to Pyramix. Sort of Sequoia and Pyramix are kind of the two main DAWs that most folks use in classical recording and that kind of thing. So yeah, it's just I, I really love having. There's sort of two tools that I can't live without: four-point editing, so source and destination projects. Unlike Pro Tools, where you're only allowed to have one project open at a time. Um, so I have stuff where I'm cutting from, things where, where I'm cutting to. I mean, I could have six projects open if I wanted. Like I had five days of different days of recording, and I've got one project where I'm editing everything into. So that's really, really essential for me. And the other one is uh, multi-track spectral cleaning. Again, it's, since I do a lot of live concert archiving work. You know, you get somebody in the front row with their candy wrapper, you know, in the middle of a movement, or somebody applauds too early or drops something on the floor. Being able to choose one example track, say, this is the noise I want to get rid of, and immediately delete that noise from 12 tracks in a matter of seconds. I can do that in Sequoia. That'd be like a 15 minute project for one edit in Pro Tools, but it takes me, you know, 30 so seconds in Sequoia. Yeah, oh yeah, I'll still spot mic. I mean, maybe not for a live thing, just because I'm trying to keep the, the visual obstructions to a minimum, but for a recording session, yeah, I absolutely still spot mic some stuff. And I've got a couple of pictures from a session here I can show you when we get to that, that auditory example. Yes, sir? So, uh, you have a set distance between the front and the back mics? Uh, really about that. Okay, so they're a coincident pair, which means sort of the, the business spot on the microphone are right on top of one another. Is that what you're asking? Right. Yeah, I would I, yeah, I wouldn't pull these apart from one another and have like the front or a TF pair close to the ensemble and put these back further in the hall. Because um, again, I'm trying to be honest to sort of this best spot in the house, best seat in the house, if that seat could be up in the air uh, to sort of help balance out the ensemble kind of perspective. So behind you, yep. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, how, do you, how do you make that choice? Listening, rehearsal, yeah, sound check. I don't make that decision before I go in. Um, uh, there are some engineers out there who sort of have, you know, a general rule of thumb. And oh, yeah, 12 feet out in front of the ensemble. Uh, for me, it's all about what I'm hearing, you know, coming through headphones. And I always show up and make as best use of that rehearsal time as I can um, to make sure I'm getting the best sound possible. Because again, you know, working on location, a lot of times I'm working in a space I've never been in before. You know, if it's a place that I've been in five, six, seven times before, sure, I can get it within, you know, maybe six or ten inches of where I think it's going to be. I'll probably still move things around a little bit. Um, but if it's a room that I haven't been in before, I, you know, there is no sort of go-to answer. If it's really reflective and really reverberant, I'm probably going to end up getting a lot closer to the ensemble. Um, if it's really dead, you know, I might go the other direction. Ah. Sure. Well, that's a really uh, sort of a really heavy reverb example because I was trying to go, you know, from one extreme to the other, sort of the dry to the reverberant. But the idea with this, you know, with this technique is you can, and the audio examples I'll play for you, I'll ride that, the, the, the rear stag pair of microphones up and down so you can sort of hear that transition. If you get really, really wet with stuff, it does make the ensemble feel like it pulls back in distance. But if you get, you know, anywhere below sort of matched gain, then the ensemble stays sort of the distance where it is, and you just bring reverberant energy up to that. So, yes, sir. Uh, I have a pair of questions that are sort of related. Okay. First is when you did your study, did you do any sort of automatic um, loudness matching between the, the tracks with different microphones? And then at the same time, did you uh, do the same, like the repeated study, but with uh, different levels in the same room, so record the same pair, but at different loudness? Ah, uh, okay. So yeah, they're gain match one across the other, right? Because we don't want to have any sort of uh, listening effects as a result of, of presentation level, right? Because the idea is we all favor things that are louder, even though they may not be better. So RMS matched. RMS matched. Yeah, absolutely. But again, it's the exact same playback every single time. 
So it's not like you're going to get a slightly higher peak in one than you are in the other because it's a different performance, right? So that's all totally uniform. So yeah, those are all gain matched. And sorry, what was the second half of your question? Uh, did you repeat the study with different lattices coming from different sources? So uh, different lattices. No, so actually during the study, we played back uh, at the beginning of the audio example uh, and just let people listen to it a couple of times and adjusted to a comfortable listening level for them. But then w they weren't allowed to touch it after that. Oh, okay. No, we just sort of went for, uh, you know, an ambient measured level that would be typical of a string quartet. Yeah. So, because, yeah, I mean, that, that there, that's an interesting aspect. That'd be an interesting thing to look at. Um, also, it'd help with noise floor if you, if you could play sort of at triple or quadruple volume of a traditional string quartet, then all of a sudden, if there's some noise or rumble in the space, that becomes way less of a factor. So you can get a cleaner recording that way. So, cool. Any other questions? Yes, sir. For the front mics, no. Um, I I I stuck or I, I adhered pretty strictly to that. Um, it's a technique that I'm really comfortable with, and I know what results that I can get from that. Um, also, since I was trying to fight the hole in the middle of effect or the hole in the middle kind of effect, if I went with a more directional option, um, that would only amplify that problem, not help solve it, right? Because if I went from cardioid to a subcardio or to a supercardioid or a hypercardioid, all of a sudden, because of the increased narrowness of the polar pattern, it's going to leave an even bigger hole in the middle, in which case I'm going to try and bring the angle of the microphones in even narrower. So, but it's an interesting th thing to try, um, certainly because then, then I could get much narrower angles with the microphones if I needed to. So, shall we do some listening? Okay, great. So these are not uh, sort of auditory test examples, which are sort of a little dry in terms of their subject matter. So these are actual commercial recordings. Um, so first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play some examples of uh, the three different selections from concerts. These were recorded by KBOC Radio um, out on location, um, sort of three slightly different styles. Um, what I'll do is I'll start off by playing for you uh, the example dry, and then I'll slowly ramp up uh, the, the rear pair of microphones so you can see how, how the reverberant energy comes in and, and hopefully the ensemble stays in position. Um, the other option that I have is I can present it uh, in surround or stereo in the space. Uh, so I think since I'm going to ride up the reverb, let's listen to it in stereo, and then I'll go back and play it once again, but we'll use the surround so you can hear it as a surround representation where I don't mess around with the levels of the surrounds, which might be a little distracting. So just give me a second to double check my mix on that. So dry. We're going to leave those off. Five, six. Great. All right, here we go. Anyway, so that gives you an idea of just a couple of different samples. And, and out of those three recordings, they were done in three different spaces, or at least two different uh, spaces. So it gives you an idea of how it can function in, in multiple different acoustics. Um, so I've also got two other cuts that I want to play for you. These uh, are not finished mixes. They're actually projects that I'm in the middle of working on right now. Um, so I I'm sort of giving the details away here, but I probably shouldn't because <laughs> the client doesn't know that I'm playing this back. Um, so. But it's, it's something I'm working on right now. And I think this is an ex the reason I'm excited about playing it back is because I think this is an example where Stag does extremely well. It's a wonderful sounding natural acoustic um, uh, out in Kansas City. Uh, there's a lot of recordings that get done in this space. Um, and, and I think it just, it, it's, this project is practically mixing itself. I mean, this is just a first edit and a rough mix on it. Um, so I, I've done very little to it other than, you know, just cut takes together. Um, this gives you a nice idea of the space and what the church looks like. Um, so, you know, stag pair uh, over the ensemble. 
Um, yeah, it's probably a little bit further away. This space is fairly bright sounding, so it's, it's probably about 12 to 15 feet in front of the ensemble and, and maybe about 10 or 11 feet in the air, um, angled down at the ensemble. Um, but it just it works really well in this space. Um, I, and depending on if people are feeling anxious to go, I can play just one or I can play two different projects. So who, who votes one? You vote two? Who votes two? Oh, okay, great. You guys want to hear this stuff. Awesome. I'm, I'm touched. Thank you. <laughs> so, all right. So this is um, uh, an arrangement actually done by the conductor of the ensemble. It's just sort of a, a, a standard alleluia. Um, let's see. Uh, how do we want to play this back? Let's, do, let's not do the surround. Let's do the stereo since I can sort of ride them up and down for you. Um, so give me a second to just make sure that that's set in the mix. And I'm just going to, there were spot mics on this session as well. I'm going to leave all the spot mics out of the mix so you can just hear, uh, just hear the stag pair. All right, let me get rid of our surrounds here for a second. Mute. And then we're going to add stag back into that. So here we go. So this is a little more up-tempo. And this will give you a little bit better idea about reverb in the space. So when you have a really good acoustic, it also works really well. <laughs> um, yes, those are shotguns. So for that particular recording, I was using uh, Sheps MK4s for the forward-facing mics and Sennheiser 8050 short shotguns for the rear-facing mics. Question? How big of a choir and how wide were they? It's about 14 singers, and when they were in the space, they probably stood, if I literally had to lay them out, it would be about the podium to about the equivalent symmetrical spot. Yeah, slight arc. Yeah, slight horseshoe kind of shape. So, yes, sir? What's the big advantage of being up so high? Is that just getting uniform distance? Uniform distance across the ensemble. Yeah, for this room, um, hard marble floors, uh, a lot of reflective, you know, very reflective surface off, the, off of the floor. So getting up that high also kills some of the, the comb filtering you get off of the floor bounce. Um, so that can be helpful. But mostly we go, you know, this is, it's traditional to go high with a main pair of mics for chamber music just because it helps equal out the distance so you don't get weird depth of field kinds of things with your mic placement. Yes, sir? Oh, right. So the reason I put the 8050 in there, because all of the recordings that I played you that were done by KBOX, so those three pieces I played before I moved on to this, thank you for bringing that up, those were all done with 8050 microphones. So that's, that's sort of their go-to choice for using that, this technique. Um, we have slightly different uh, professional sort of opinions on the issue. I think that those recordings would probably be, you know, stand to be improved a little bit by short shotgun microphones. But that's the engineer's choice. They make great recordings, so who am I to criticize? Um, so, yeah, that's why I threw the 8050s in there. So, yes, sir. Um, I want to compliment you on this. I think this is a much better presentation than most radio recordings. Which Mm -hmm. uh, when you're working with this uh, in a session, I'm not really sure. I mean, I really like what you got, especially your midpoint there. Mm -hmm. with your fever. But I'm not really. Do you have your? Do uh, you have omnis on the side to do? Uh, the, uh, I'm not really sure what the uh, philosophy is um, to use this since you have any flexibility that you want in your session. Mm -hmm. And let's say... Uh, well, how about this? What if I played you back of this same recording a pair of Omni space microphones in the hall and you compared that to well, Stag? No, I'm not saying... Because I have that. I can play it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I also... For, so I, I tend well, my to... Point, listen to my point. Okay. Because I'm a heavy closer in this area. Uh, my point is, uh, let's say you have a certain um, uh, angle there with your shot with your shot sounding nice, but why uh, why lock yourself into that? Why not use an ORTF uh, as a starting point? Uh, have some omnis up on the side to give you your width and your and your uh, uh, your uh, uh, ambience. Mm -hmm. And the basis of my technique, for example, is something close, something far, mm -hmm. and blending. Sure. Classic technique. 
Um, but I'm not really sure what advantage it is to use uh, your setup uh, when you have a uh, when you have any choice that you want it could make, but in but you are uh, varying your angle of your ambience mics, your rear facing mics, um, but you're locked into that uh, to that uh, to that one position. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? I think so. I, this is, and it makes great sense in live work because it's easy to put up and it's quick. But when you ever have every possibility to pick and choose, mm -hmm. uh, why do you still use this as your as your uh, uh, anchor? Mm -hmm. exactly. Well, I, so again, this is not a one size fits all mic technique, and I don't always use this. Um, that said, that said, one of the things that comes up frequently is you know working in houses of worship. A lot of times you have halls that are a cruciform floor plan, in which case the spot where the choir is ends up being a very narrow room. Yet the spot ten and typically they're set up you know not unlike this where they're on a staircase that happens to be you know within a few feet of where that transition goes from this small acoustic box out to the cruciform spot in the room. And even just a reposition of the microphones an inch or two can make a huge difference if the microphones happen to line up right with that threshold of the change in the width of the room. By using the, the rear shotgun pair, I can focus in on the lateral reflective energy across the cruciform, and I can get a, a, a wider sense of the room and not be so critical in my mic placement where I'm right at that threshold where the room width changes from one to the other. Um, so I like to experiment a lot in my recordings, and if I've got the time you know, during setup and whatnot to put up extra microphones, I often do. I did for this recording. So they're out of the frame on the left and the right side, but about 25 feet to the left and 20 feet to the right. I've also got a pair of Shep's uh, MK2H Omni microphones in the hall. So if you want, I could play that back for you and you could compare no, what I that does. a very good dis uh, uh, reason for doing that. One of the things on this is you are uh, going by some of the research papers that have emphasized the lateral uh, reflections. Is that right? You're, Absolutely. You are, you are, this is a real basis of why you have very widely splayed uh, rear-facing mics. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to make good sense, and I especially liked it in this, uh, what you played here when you had it at a medium distance, because it, it did not sound distinctly too wide, uh, but you were getting uh, the, uh, the side, you were getting the early ref the, uh, reflections. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm taking a crew of two or three of three or four people out, and if it's a session, I'm going to move things around, like you say, during the rehearsal, and I don't want to be tied to a, um, a configuration. Um, I guess there's no problem in recording all these channels, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just not, uh, uh, despite your good um, explanations, I'm not really sure why this would go instead of combining something close and far, or let's mm -hmm. say a, a pure ORTF pair and, mm -hmm. and experimenting with a, a spaced omni. Mm -hmm. I'm not really going for the explanation for the, the, the building uh, shape. Got it. Well, again, you know, I, I'd be happy to play it back for you, because I think sort of the, the proof is in the no, pudding if you listen. So. Got it. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm just curious. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, I've got one last track that I'd love to play. Any other questions before I jump into that? Yes, sir. It's, hopefully, it's not off the wall. Uh, you use an interface between the mics and your dome. Uh, oh, what interface am I using? Yeah, uh, I, I use a couple of different things, but primarily I have RME interfaces. Um, I believe this session was done. It was more channels than one I could do with just my uh, just my uh, Fireface. So I all ha also had an ADI8, but yeah, RME interfaces. So sure, um, the front end is is also a, a common is spot mics. I tend to use. Um, a true precision eight mic pre and all the mains uh, and sort of fixed hall non-spot microphones. Those are all Millennia Media preamps. So eight channel oh, Millennia. Have you ever tried this with larger diaphragm side address? I I haven't because it's difficult to configure. Um, 
I, I've wanted to try it. Uh, I just I haven't gotten the opportunity to do it where I've got the time to be able to experiment with that. Because I think it could be really great. I think you're right. Uh, it's just, you know, it's always been sort of more of a convenience factor for me. And I, I really love the sound of Shep's microphones. I don't feel like they're lacking something that I would be able to get with a large diaphragm microphone um, over and above that. But I mean, certainly you can, you can use this technique with that. Um, as long as you've got shotgun microphones that have a short enough sort of handle on the back side that you can get them at the same elevation because large diaphragm microphones you don't have to do this sort of oddball elevation swapping thing you can have them at the same spot so you just have to have a short handle on the back so that they're not butting up against one another limiting your angle so but yeah please try it I'd love to hear how that works out so okay oh you have oh great and how did it work out Works great. Awesome. Would you be willing to share some of the recorded material with me? I'd love to hear it. Uh, I'll, I'll see you afterwards. Great. Awesome. Sounds good. All right. So let me play you the, the final thing. So this is uh, Stephen Paulus's Road Home. Uh, it's kind of a famous piece uh, in, in the choir literature. And I just think that this is, uh, again, it's a first edit, so it's not done. But even despite that, it's pretty beautifully performed. Um, the question is whether or not I want to sort of ruin it by riding those levels up and down. Um, no? You want me to just leave it static? OK. So uh, give me a second to find a balance, because I don't think that that's where it is right now. So I'll, I'll sort of ride it up as we listen. But I'll try and get out of your way as, as quickly as possible here. So uh, let me just check my mix again. So again, this is going to be no surrounds. It'll all be presented in stereo, either headphones or the loudspeakers in the space. Thank you all so much for coming.